I, uh, I don't claim any kind of expertise in scenarios, but I'm fascinated with it. I've been, I've been working, I suppose I've been working in Cornwall one way or another for about 15 years, a good part of 15 years uh, on uh, one project after another. Um, and I, there's nothing that I have to tell you about this place except what I see in it as uh, somebody who isn't from here and who's trying to work with what's here. And that may give me a slightly different view of what's going on uh, from yours, but I don't claim it's a better view, it's just my view. I mean, I grew up in New England and I grew up sailing and I grew up interested in places on the water. And New England and Cornwall have a lot in common. The villages on the water have changed there as here from fishing and a bit of farming and a bit of mining to tourism. And those changes, it's very interesting when you get to the water because in most places the water start, it starts out being the kind of industrial estate and then it becomes the, the kind of front the front of the town, the view from the town. And that transformation happens in different ways in different places. And those differences is what started getting me interested and it's in, in a way what I want to talk about. I mean this is this is a this is the old Herishoff uh, uh, yacht building center in in uh, Narragansett Bay where the tidal range is very narrow and it's quite a protected body of water although it can, it's continuous out to the Atlantic Ocean. So you, you can get working buildings right out in the water in a situation like that, which is very different from a lot of working waterfronts. Anyway, um, the, just down the way, the next one, next slide, um, is Newport, Rhode Island, which has most dramatically different frontages. On the, on the side facing Long Island Sound is the so-called bungalows built by uh, New York families uh, in the 19th century, mostly early 20th century, as kind of summer cottages. And they're gigantic, unbelievable buildings. Some of them are absolutely wonderful. But that's very different from the working harbor, which is 17th and 18th century and 19th century, uh, next slide, which is inside the harbor. And the pattern of development there is this, where you have very dense, dense residential streets coming right down and out onto the piers, which, and it was a, it was basically, it was a, primarily an oyster town, but also a fishing town. Um, and the pattern is very clear there, the sort of pattern of development, the relationship between the streets and the piers. There's a street that runs parallel with the water, which is called Thames Street, just to drive everyone mad. Um, next slide. Um, that, in the 19th century, was a very urban place. It was a busy place, heavy commercial use of that street. Next slide. What started happening from the 19th century is the, you know, the fishing industry started dropping off. Tourism started building up. A lot of the commercial buildings ran out of any reason for Just being there, fishing. were pulled down, and a strange sort of ranch style started infiltrating this street. So the character of the street changed quite dramatically. And at the same time, next slide, what started happening is that buildings <coughs> started, instead of being linear buildings, processing buildings, factory buildings, running back from the water, they started building buildings that faced the water, hotels, you know tourist buildings. So the pattern started changing and the result of that, if you go to the next slide, is that whereas the, the, these little residential streets used to just, used to come down and out into the harbor, they start getting blocked up and, and crossed off. And what was a kind of very airy, clear set of relationships to the harbor, they suddenly turn into slightly mean little streets. There's some beautiful little houses and things, but they don't have that connection out to the sea and the world that that, that, that situation has. And the next slide, please. It was very interesting because there, there's this very dense uh, development on the harbor, and then there are parks which have the public buildings in them. So this was the first form that a library took in town, in the middle, surrounded by green, very different <coughs> from this kind of pattern of development. And we were, we were working on a library, which was really a replacement and extension of this building. And we very carefully kept it in the middle of the park, away from the edges, because 
that seemed to us to be the distinction between the public buildings surrounded by green and, and this kind. And we ran up against a planning authority who said to us, no, but we believe in the new urbanism. If you go to the next slide, the new urbanism was a, a kind of urban strategy which is still very, uh, very much adopted by planning authorities in the United States. Actually, two of my ex-students <laughs> were the ones who developed Seaside in Florida, you've probably seen, and, and some other communities, in reaction against the kind of open landscape that you get in American towns, where you get a gas station and a, and a house and, and a mall and another house and space, kind of meaningless space all over the place. They were saying, no, we've got to collect our towns back together. We've got to come up to the pavement edge. We've got to build houses cheek by jowl. Well, eat your heart out, Newport. I mean, Newport is exactly what the new urbanists were trying to get back to. But the, the Newport city planners were saying, you must build your library on the street because we're new urbanists. And you say, no, no, what you've got to do is look at the difference between the dense residential area and these open public gardens and maintain those differences because that's what this place is about. So what I'm really going to talk about tonight is differences and how, how you identify the differences and how you enjoy them and make architectural decisions around them because I think that really is at the heart of, of how you deal with. New England has made a lot of mistakes by thinking that by turning the, what you do to make a new community is you build more Cape Cod cottages. And sometimes that's exactly what you do build, but that isn't always the right answer because that isn't always the context that you're actually working in. These towns have huge differences within them. Next, please. Um, so when I came to work in Falmouth, I mean, it's quite like Newport in a way because it has a kind of 19th century uh, front to the, to the heart, to the to the outer, to the sea, to, to the channel, and it's got the inner working harbour, which is protected and really 17th and 18th century, 19th century harbour. So there's the same kind of duality in Falmouth as you have in Newport next. I'm not going to talk at huge length about the Maritime Museum, but it's in a very interesting place in Falmouth, and that's what I want to talk about. The site for the Maritime Museum is right there. This is the old town. This is the commercial docks, and thank goodness they've got them. That's what keeps Falmouth honest, is that there's actually working waterfront and working community there. And then this is the hotels, and a lot of them have become sort of retirement homes now, unfortunately. That's what happens to hotels. But, but that frontage is the kind of looking at the sea uh, frontage. So this, this in, the, in the early 19th century, probably 1820 sometime, you're standing up by Pendennis Castle somewhere, looking back at the town, and this site, which is where the Maritime Museum is, was a, well, and in fact there's a ship careen there, it was all timber yards and shipbuilding in a series of kind of tidal pools where you could easily haul a ship up, bring it in, haul it out, and so forth. So it's an interesting site, right at the narrowest neck between the inner harbour and the, and the outer frontage, which seems like a very interesting place to build. Next. So it was sitting between this, which is the, or the original harbor, custom house, harbor master uh, fishing port, uh, next, has that kind of texture scale and architecture. And then immediately on the other side of the site, next, is that. So, and it's right between the two, and in fact, I won't get into the complications of the fact that the site had been taken over by Peter de Savary and half built with houses, and then he sort of, that branch of the de Savary empire disappeared, and so half the site was available, and that's where the Maritime Museum was, but that sort of complicates the whole story. Uh, next, please. So, we spend a lot of time just drawing the, what happens along the waterfront and how you go from one thing to another next. And fairly quickly got to the point where we were quite convinced that this was very different, both from the town and the docks, but that the biggest building, which is the museum, ought to identify itself with the docks in scale and, and even in kind of content. Uh, and that the, the sort of commercial development around it could be much more a part of the town. Next, please. And, it, and 
looking at uh, photographs of what had been in this, this sort of sandbar -y area where that had been reclaimed by de Savary, that's what had been there. It's kind of what you might call industrial vernacular. In other words, sheds built to make something in them or to store timber or to build ships. And it seemed to us re sensible that you pick up on that as part of that part of the waterfront and as something that where boats are built and kept. And you basically start out with the museum by thinking, well, let's make a shed. It seems a relevant place to make a shed. Uh, so the whole, the whole scheme became <coughs> shed-like. It's very different from the town because the site is very different from the town. Next slide, please. And actually, what's interesting is that you can see in this slide that the scale of it, you know, it's not trying to identify with what everyone's... People said it should look like Falmouth. Well, looking like Falmouth was rendered France with little windows in it. And it's not that kind of a site, nor is it that kind of a building. Um, so it's actually pulled out from the rest of town and identifies a bit more with the, the docks in scale. And actually, it's interesting that it also has a slightly different climate because it's pulled out far enough so it's out from under the hill that faces the harbour, which actually shades the harbour quite early in the afternoon. You get shadow along the, the main harbour frontage, but the museum site is out in the sun because it's just that much further out into the harbour. So it was all about differences and why something on this site can be actually quite different from something quite close to it, but of a very different character. Next, please. <coughs> and while I was in Falmouth, I got involved in, there was, a, there was a kind of campaign to build, here again, just to, here we go, there's the outer um, harbour and the inner harbour and the, the site for the museums right there. Um, <coughs> there was a campaign to basically build a boardwalk all the way along this frontage. And uh, I, I, was a, I was one of several people who thought that really wasn't a good idea for two reasons. One is that you've already got you know, the long walk facing the sea, the views out and all that. What makes, what makes Falmouth really interesting is the difference between those two things. And uh, this route, which is the main, has several names, but is the main commercial street in Falmouth, uh, depends for the trade in those shops. So the people, in order to you can you can duck down to the to the harbour in various places, but in order to get from one part to the other, you have to walk along the street. And even with that concentration of people, the shops in Falmouth were a lot of them closing down in the winter. So the idea that you make a parallel route with another kind of commercial activity on it and expect the old route to stay alive just didn't seem right to me. Anyway, so we, we, we do, these sort of anatomical differences between parts of town I think are really important and actually, now we go to the next slide I guess, I mean that's, that's the character of the 19th century frontage with Falmouth Hotel and various things beyond and then next, I mean this is a rather unattractive view of the backs of those buildings that really open off of the commercial street and back onto the water. But the nice thing about this part of town is, next please, that this keeps happening. You keep, as you walk along the street, you get a little way down and there's a pub or there's a, there's a view or there's a little bit that you can walk along. And it just makes it very vivid somehow in a way that, and the differences between them are very interesting. And one of the reasons that we put a a tower on the museum is that it's one of the few places in Falmouth where you can see both waterfronts and understand that they're both there. I mean, a lot of people come to Falmouth and don't realize there are <coughs> two waterfronts, although they're very, very close together. They're not aware from one of the other. Next, please. Um, I mean, sometimes the differences aren't side by side, but are one above the other. The, this is uh, Charlestown Harbor, which is, you know, Georgian Harbor near um, St. Austell. And uh, it's fascinating because there's a whole world below ground level, which is the working harbor and the, the old silos from the, the China clay that came down from the, the clay dry up the hill. And then there's a whole other round of architecture above ground, which is residential, it's where people lived. And um, next please. Um, Square Sale, who I think are still there, but certainly 10, 15 years ago, so they were interested in, they, they you know, they, 
run, build, repair, sale, rent out, uh, particularly rent out to film companies, all these ships. And they wanted a workshop down in the harbor and they had a terrible time with the planners. I mean, first they tried to do something that looked like cottages. Well, that's wrong because it's down in the harbor. They, you, you shouldn't build a cottage in, in, the, in the working zone. Uh, and then they, then they would try to do a sort of pastiche 17th century factory, and that's wrong because it suddenly became a sort of stage set uh, rather than the, the authenticity of this place is what makes it so popular as a film set. And once you start being inauthentic, you really devalue it. We had a go at, um, next please, at, at doing a, uh, here, another shed, um, uh, a commercial shed, shed, really. It was a sail loft and a workshop down on the quayside. Um, but it kept clear of the cliff, and you could, there was a route that, that sort of snaked down it so the public could get a glimpse of what was going on and then go back up to the road. But it was try, not trying to look like a particular age. Next, next slide. It was a kind of shed that had, was basically modern construction, modern windows, but it had big doors so that if you were filming Mall Flanders or whatever it was, you slid the doors across and you had a backdrop which was perfectly authentic as a piece of shed architecture that could have been built virtually any time, or you could dress it to be whatever you wanted without <coughs> making it too fictitious. Um, next, please. So that, well, that, that's, that's that. It, 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 was a, it was a very interesting thing to work on. It never happened for funding reasons, but it was very interesting to think about what's real, what isn't, what is a workshop, what's the difference between the upper village and this lower realm that, that's so important in the harbour. Next, please. Um, I won't spend much time on this. Uh, so, uh, Lyme Regis, they, the uh, County Council recently did quite a bit of flood control so that there were sites that became available as building sites that hadn't been in Lyme Regis. And next, please. I think, again, it was about looking at where it really was and what, what ought to be going on. It was this part of town where, um, just beyond the slide, you turn the corner and go into the big fossil beach that goes up to Charmouth. So this, this is really a beachfront, kind of Jurassic coast around the corner here. But you can see this is very dense urban stuff. This is the main way into town, and then the main street goes up that way. And this is a theater, which was, has its front door out here. So we, they, and they wanted to build a kind of fossil museum uh, on, on this site, because it was, became available as a building site next. And our, our, our proposal was that you make more dense the bits that are in close to the road that goes through town and that get you to the front of the theater. You, you make that into as much a, a, as urban a little place as you can. But beyond that, you don't try to turn it into something like that. You tuck things into the hillside. Maybe you have one little object that kind of looks across at Charmouth and connects back, but that you, you keep it as a very different part of town. It's not part of the the kind of dense fabric of town. And I think that's right, that it's part of this, this the fossil beach rather than the town next. So, at long last, um, <laughs> we come to St. Ives, and, and I mean, look at that, that's remarkable. Look at how many, look at for a tiny place, how many different places there are in St. Ives. I mean, that's what I find <coughs> fantastic. And I just want to track around and think about some of the differences in what they say about how you, how you build there and what the buildings there mean. Um, and I'll do it very quickly. And, I, and as I said, I, I, I'm slightly uh, nervous about saying anything about St. Ives to this audience, but here we go. Um, next slide, please. I mean, there, there's the equivalent of, again, that's that sort of beachfront, enjoying the beach, hotels. That's that part of St. Ives, Portminster Beach. And it's, it's, it hasn't, oh, sorry, that's a terrible slide. Anyway, sorry. The, the, but it hasn't changed very much. I mean, it's kind of... It right. has. Well, it hasn't changed, no, but it has, it's still recognizable as a hillside with residential things on it and a, and a, a pleasure beach at the bottom. So fundamentally, it still remains that. Then, as you 
go along the coast. Can we go to the next one? That stretch where just beyond the the sort of arts club is not yeah, beyond the beyond the you know, from from the what's now the lifeboat station over to the arts club is much denser right down on the waterfront and it's a very interesting stretch if we go to the next slide I mean it's um, it's very exposed unlike the harbor it's very exposed so you get I'm very interested in what you see on postcards in Sinai so if we go to the next one it's that stretch that always has this kind of postcard and that's not surprising I mean it's it's got buildings right up to the edge and it's pounded by the waves. I mean, I've seen the, the spray climb right to the top of the arts club down there. It's really quite dramatic. So, I mean, that's an old postcard, but there's, I think, next one is, I mean, this is days of Photoshop. It's slightly lurid, but, but it's, the same, it's the same stretch and the same message about that stretch of beach. Um, then if we go on to the next one, I'd like to, if, if we start at this end of the harbor, where the, the pier is, I mean, for, and, I, and I'm not going to quote the years because you'll correct me, but there's a waterfront road there that's been there for some time. And if we look at the next slides, it's interesting that those buildings were all built, they, built, they, built, they were built with frontages to that road. So they're fronts of buildings, and they remain fronts of buildings, and they haven't changed much. I mean, there are a few more balconies and some of the windows have got bigger. But basically, they're the same, it's the same kind of pattern of architecture, the same sort of scale of architecture, still with the fronts facing the front. Um, it's very interesting, as you, the next slide, as you get along a bit further and the road starts ducking in behind, you get backs. And you can even in that slide uh, see that the backs take a different form from the fronts. They're recognizable as backs. And there they are more recently. The, the architecture of the backs is different from the architecture of the fronts and I find that fascinating. Although these are, that window has the same kind of view as that window, it's a very different kind of window because it's a back window not a front window even though they both face the sea. Um, and even now, I mean, th this is obviously a much later edition, but certainly those, if you compare that with that, they're very different. And, 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 I, and I think fronts and backs are very interesting. So then, when you get to, if we go to the next slide, when you get to this part of the harbor, of course, for a long time, the fronts were here, these were backs, like at Falmouth, where 4th Street, you entered a lot of these buildings, you got to a lot of these buildings at 4th Street, and their backs were on the waterfront. Um, and they were they had that character. They were a sort of wall at the lowest level, very unpenetrated wall with any openings at a very high level. They were not buildings which which opened onto the beach. Um, um, but then in 1922, of course, this road was built, and suddenly the backs became the fronts. And of course, 1922 and the years following. 20th century kind of, it's pre presented suddenly a 20th century commercial opportunity that had to do with things that make money quickly and, and disappear quite quickly. Um, restaurants, cafes, uh, little shops, things like that. So the character of that part of the frontage, next please, uh, is very varied because it came about in varied ways. Um, so, for instance, at that end, uh, you start, that was a back, but it starts getting, it starts getting fronts led into it, but it's very clear, you can see what the roots of that building are and how it got there, still, through the changes that have happened. Then there are lots of kind of insertions that make a back, a front, in uh, sometimes not very clear kinds of architectural language. I mean, there are bits and pieces that partly because there are a lot of existing buildings that have been kept and opened up a bit on the back and then new buildings built between them. So there's quite a range and difference of architecture along there. And it's interesting that you don't see many postcards in the postcard racks that move in close on this part of town. You'll see it from a distance with a view of the whole harbor. But the close-up views aren't of this architecture because I don't think people see this as fundamentally St. Ives architecture. 
it's a different kind of slightly expedient and um, rather um, um, sort of opportunistic building, let's say. So next, please. And it takes, you know, it does take a variety of forms. Next. And, you know, I mean, somebody really had a vision of making a frontage along there at some point. It's a slightly, I would say, graceless um, attempt at doing that, and nobody's picked it up, so that it's, it's slightly um, left stranded proposing a kind of frontage there that has never really happened, and I think it's probably just as well it hasn't. Uh, by distinction, of course, 4th Street maintains its very clear attitude to what fronts are, how a street works, uh, whether, they're, whether the buildings in, in their roots are 17th, 18th, or 19th century, they're fairly consistent in scale and size and orientation, and they make um, quite a coherent street. And very often you get the sense of the bowl that you're in. You, you kind of get the, the rim of town visible from the street, too. So you're very clear where you are next. And it also has the left bits of little, what some call oaks, I don't know what they're called here, that, that would have gone down to the beach, basically, originally, between the buildings. And it's interesting looking at, I mean, the chapel never changed what its idea front and back were. I mean, that remains the back of the chapel facing the harbour. It's quite, I mean, that's quite an amusing juxtaposition. There's, there's the post-1922 world finding a little frontage next to this great looming back. And of course, the front of the chapel's on 4th Street. And it's at a very interesting place where, if you go to the next slide, where 4th Street sort of slides past the chapel and back out and connects up to the harbor. And that, that's a really key place in St. Ives, I think, where the, the, the two systems come back together. And it's also, if you go to the next slide, it's also, I mean, there it is. Um, it's also this funny juxtaposition between chapel architecture and church architecture, which I, I, I'll come back to that. Um, but to go on to the next slide, um, the other, it's also, just at that point, it's the place where the two beaches, where the harbor and the Portsmouth Beach come closest together, and there's a real connection. It's the way, that, the point where people mostly go from the harbor to Fourth Mirror Studios and the Tate is at that, that narrow neck because it's quite a coherent connection at that point. So then we come to Fourth Mirror uh, Beach, which of course I'm, I've been very fascinated with over the last few years. If we go to the next slide, I mean, that is so different from any other part of St. Ives or any place else that I've ever been in. That, that moment when the whole of that frontage was fishermen down below and briefly fishermen up above as well, but only briefly because by the, the 1890s you can see the gleam off all the skylights. Uh, those were painters up above. And that's, that's unbelievable. You know, that, that's fantastic. That, uh, that conjunction of built form and who's using them and how it relates to the two key industries in town basically is really fascinating. So we're dealing we're dealing with the the one remaining bit, which I've always I mean I've known it for years. I've always loved it as a kind of stranded whale sitting there, this kind of surface that just sort of heaves up and over all these sh roof shapes. It's just a fantastic thing. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I mean, it's, it's partly remarkable because you're not quite prepared for what it is when you look at the frontage on the street. I mean, those, those are the two parts of the Portsmouth Studio scene from Back Road West, and um, it's quite domestic in scale next. Um, and the, it's a top and bottom issue again because it's partly domestic in scale because the street is here, and the beach is here, and that's two stories below the street. Two full, active stories of accommodation below the street. So it's a big building on the beach, and it's a little building on the street. Next. And, uh, I mean, the, the, you know the story. I, I don't have to tell you the history of this thing, but that whole lower section, the, the Smeaton Wall, that really originally was built just to keep sand from sweeping from one side of town to the other and then became the backbone for 
pilchard cellars and then the pilchard cellars grew and then the net lofts and various other fishermen support stuff happened on top and then one American came along and got hold of one of the upper spaces, climbed up a ladder and said this is a good place to paint. And within 10 years, all of the upper part of that building was the studios that are there today. I mean, I, it's, it's, it, it was incredibly quick. It was like between 18 something, 18 and, 19, and 1897, I think. By 1897, pretty much all of you see, all, all that you see there was there. Um, okay. I mean, that, that top and bottom thing is very interesting and so nice because, I mean, you see retaining walls all over the place. You can't see these because the, there's probably a bit too much light, but ne next. Um, there are a lot of places in St. Ives where you're very aware that there's one thing going on at the bottom of the building and something quite different going on up above and always has been. And, and the whole pattern of paving and the way, the way water escapes, the whole treatment of water is all part of that two level um, thing that's happening in St. Ives. So it's very important in Portsmere Studios, as you come around the corner here, you can see down this ramp, which goes down one floor below street level. When you go through that gate, you keep going down to a courtyard, which is the access to the fisherman's cellar, and that's two stories below street level. Next, please. But there's the courtyard in relation to the perimeter of the studios. The ramp goes down and under a building and out into the courtyard, and the rest is um, cellars and studios. So just to um, then go through the ingredients in the building, the lower level is has always belong to the fishermen. They're not they're not pressing pilchards anymore, but they're net setting basically in the in the cellars and storing an awful lot of junk. So the fishermen's junk, but that's another story. Uh, but they're beautiful, <coughs> beautiful cellars with huge Baltic pine beams that we we think were pump shafts in. Um, mines, but came on the deck, I'm sure they came from the Baltic on the deck of ships, but the, it's like 15 meter long, straight beams, just from one side of the cellar to the other. Unbelievable, absolutely beautiful things. Um, and then when you get up to the studios, it's this real looking, through the looking glass world, where you open the little blue door on the street with a little domestic window next to it, and whoom, you're sort of out in the sea, and particularly at high tide when, you can't, when there's no beach in view and you just see the sea, and particularly when there's a storm, it is stunning. It's really terrific. Um, and the studios take a variety of forms, and they've gone into a kind of sad state of disrepair over the years, but most painters are pretty happy with disrepair until the building starts falling on them. And, soaking their paintings, which was beginning to, to happen a bit. Um, that's the School of Painting, which is one of the studios, which is up top on the street edge. So, next please. Well, we, had, we had three things to do, and the first one was to repair the building. Well, you want to repair the building, but not change its character too much, because it, part, of it is, part of it is the story of the building, it's who's been in there, it's you know, Ben Nicholson, Patrick Heron, Sandra Blow, Willie Barnes Graham, da -da 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 -da. all the people who've been in the building sort of leave an echo behind them because it, so much stuff has come out of that over the <coughs> years. Um, also, you don't want it to be so perfect that, I mean, artists don't particularly like buildings that are too perfect because they love making a mess of them. So they you, they want to have permission to, to operate the way they always do and not be too like this in their studios. I mean, they, it just wouldn't work. So we were trying to keep as much as we could. So I, I found myself just drawing every board in the building, quite literally. Just drawing every board, figuring out how they were fixed, uh, recording whether people had, this particular studio had little blocks that that artist hung paintings from just recorded the lot. And then what we tried to do was we had to take take the building apart, basically, because we had to get fire separation into the building. We had to get some sound insulation in the building because fishermen and painters and other painters don't all like the same 
music on their <laughs> radios. And um, so we had to sort of pull the building apart and then put it back together again. So it was like making, unmaking a puzzle and taking part of it and putting it back and throwing away the bits that were absolutely unsalvageable. Um, on, the, on the outside, I mean, this was, a, this was a particular disaster point when that whole window blew in. And at that point, and with water coming down through this gutter and just <coughs> ruining the building, it was clear that something had to be done. Um, the, the, the roof had perished and it was covered in sort of bitumen and all kinds of things. The, this stuff had gone. The, the skylights had been uh, covered in sort of wriggly plastic. Um, a lot of the windows were rotten. Uh, so we started out by saying, okay, we do basic repairs. We've got to replace a lot of the windows because they're in such bad shape. We've got to do something about these plastic skylights because they, 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 they don't work very well in terms of light or insulation or anything else. Um, so next slide, we, we replaced all the skylights with sort of traditional patent glazing on timber. So it's glass. Um, and we replaced most of the windows. We put back where we could. We put the boards that were there. Um, we left where we could the, the kind of hanging system that people had installed in different studios. So the studios are all quite different because people had done different things to them over the years. We put at high level, and maybe the next slide is more typical. This was a particularly big studio. We put at high level um, some heating pipes that were, are just designed to keep the background from freezing. Uh, because one of, the, one of the things that's worse for the building is having water get in anywhere and, and freeze and condense and drip all over the place. So just keeping the building above freezing is important. So we're doing that and then, next slide, we're putting back uh, wood burning stoves which used to be in there but the insurers insisted that they come out because they were a fire risk and the, the artists all missed them so they've gone back. But you can see, I mean, in some cases we've got new walls. We've managed to find Cornish Douglas fir to do all the structural timber. We had to get our structural engineer to kind of certify it himself because there was no international certification system as good timber grown in Cornwall. We couldn't use that for finishing timber though, but we found that there's a lot of larch going begging these days because larch t apparently tends to grow in similar places to chestnut. And the chestnut is being attacked by whatever it is that's attacking chestnuts and to protect the chestnuts, people are clearing out great swathes of larch. So there was a lot of larch going. I, I don't know that I love larch, it's quite naughty. Somebody, Somebody said about studios, it's like living in the Wild West. I mean, that larch can be painted and probably will, but we're leaving it to kind of settle down. Anyway, it's very sustainable to be using up a lot of wood that's being cut down for, for another purpose. So we've got new walls, but we're also keeping a lot of old walls. And where people have hanging systems, they're keeping them. Um, and next, please. On the outside, we've done the minimum amount to just keep the thing sound. So where in the 50s, the windows in the cellars were partly filled up because the sand actually came up to something like this level in, 19, in the mid-50s and had to be bulldozed away. We're leaving the brick infill, but we're not pretending it's anything other than brick infill. We're replacing the, the windows that had sort of perished. Um, We've re-rendered using sand from the beach that's all washed to get the salt out, so it's just kind of local sand. And the major job was re in completely redoing the roofs using, um, in the first phase, Delaval slate and then Trevillet slate, but all local slate, all laid to diminishing courses and laid wet in cement, which, which, is, uh, which is the way, in mortar, which is the way they were originally laid. Um, and they, they did a really good job on that. I mean, it was quite a fight to get the, the mortar right, get the slate the right sizes, and, but it, 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 it's a beautiful roof. Next, please. Um, originally, three of the big studios were one gigantic space. Uh, uh, next, please. Of which this, what's now Studio 5, was probably about a third of that great big studio. 
So there's been subdivision happening over the years, and we were, we were actually asked to do three things. One was to repair the building, which is what I've been talking about. But the second and third was, first of all, there was no way to get any disabled people anywhere into the building. I mean, it was all down steep ramps or upstairs. Or, and so there was a challenge to try to get a few more, a, a, most of the studios accessible. Um, and there, there was a real need to figure out how to keep the building from getting in this state. Again, the reason it got in this state is that the rents from 10 artists, if you were charging them a rent that was friendly to artists, was not paying for maintaining a building like this, which is basically facing a gale that comes from New York and is built like a, a, a you know, a, a wooden ship, but has had no maintenance. You, you can't, you know, it, it, it just can't survive without some care and attention. So the only way anybody could think of was to get more artists in. So some further subdivision, like adding little starter studios at the street front where you get nice sunny windows onto the street. It's not a big studio with north windows, but it's a nice working space. Um, this is a slightly funny diagram. We originally thought we'd put a, a, a sort of builder's hoist in the courtyard as a lift instead of in interrupting the building. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, that kind of rack and pinion lift that seemed part of a kind of working courtyard. But it got, there was one supplier who started giving us trouble and pushing the price up and up and up. And we ended up finally putting a lift in the building. Um, next, please. But we also said, well, let's add two brand new studios on the roof. So that's a new studio, and that's a new studio. Um, and that was a very interesting argument with, uh, by the time, by the time we were really having the argument, the building was grade two star listed, and that meant that English Heritage were very much involved, so that we, we were talking to them as well as to the local conservation officer. Um, because the, the sort of traditional conservation attitude would be, this is a great, this is a, an important listed building, don't change anything on the outside of it. And the argument, our argument was, this is not a designed, symmetrical Georgian facade. This is an, a sort of industrial vernacular building that's grown like Topsy, heaved itself up into the form it's in. And a bit more heaving is entirely consistent with the way the thing has developed. And the, re the most important thing that we're doing here is not preserving a few slates and boards, although we've taken a lot of trouble to do that, but keeping painters and fishermen working on that site as they always have continuously since the artist moved in in the 1890s. And English Heritage very much backed that, didn't they, Chris? I mean, they, they said, yes, that's right. It's the continuity of activity and traditional use and the two key Falmouth industries still working side by side in the way they always have along that beach. That's what we're trying to keep. So the only way we could do that was to add studio. So the next, next slide, please. So that's a kind of photograph of the studios before we started and a photo montage showing the new studios. And I, you know, I think it's fine, actually. In fact, I think this one helps the rather awkward relationship to um, the building next to it. And I think there's no harm in, in having another in this sequence. Um, next, please. So, I've got, I've got terrible slides, I'm afraid, because scaffolding's part up and part down. There's the new studio at that end, against um, the Piazza Flats. And um, that, that connects up with the uh, original school of painting studio on the street. So they're at the same level. So that gives them an expanded territory on that top floor. Um, and this is, uh, this is repair up to here. We'll come on to. So if we go to the next slide, that's the view from the new top floor where the stair and lift come up. So you've got a painting studio, the old painting studio to your left on the street and the new painting studio to your right going out to the, to the beach. And actually, you can see over that roof out to sea, so you get quite a view from the top of this lobby uh, out to sea. And that's, um, then that's the other new studio, to the, the one, the third in the, the row of dormers, in a way. 
And it was very interesting t talking about how you detail something like this, because of course the traditional way of, of doing something with a listed building is to do the new bit in a very different way. So, you know, you have a Georgian house and you put a steel and glass link, or you put a glass link before you do anything else. So it was like a zipper that absolutely visually and architecturally separates the new thing from the old thing. And that seemed mad here. I mean, to make those two things on the roof into some uh, modern uh, uh, addition seemed silly. Uh, equally, I wouldn't do something that's a sort of pastiche. But here, there's a kind of timeless architecture that has to do with making a loft space, putting some paint and glazing into a skylight, putting some slate on the roof. I mean, it's modern, or it's not modern, it doesn't matter, it's, it's, it's kind of timeless um, vernacular building, if you like. It's sort of very straightforward stuff. And I think if anybody knows about building and looks in detail at this, they'll say, oh, that must have been built recently. Fine. But from a distance, we're not trying to say, look, we've got a new piece here and a new piece here. We're just saying, we've, you know, the whole building has kind of grown a bit. Um, Next, please. So that's all about just tweaking things in St. Ives, which I have found utterly fascinating. But there's, there's a, I just wanted to finish by talking a little bit about how you put new buildings into places like this. Well, that was a new building in 19... Early. Yeah, no, early 20th century that building was built. Um, and it was making a point for sort of religious symbolic reasons, which uh, now are irrelevant because it's no longer, it hasn't been a church really since, really since the First World War. And, and of course since the 40s, it's, it's been very closely connected with Portmere Studios because it's come, become the gallery for the Center of Society of Artists, many of whom were working in Portmere Studios, and it's right across from the studio. So yeah, I find the interesting thing about this building, if you go to the next slide, is that it's, there it is, it, it's almost like a bridge between this little way up from the, from the harbor, and that's Norway Square, and that's Porthmere Studios, and there's the Tate over there. It's, it's a kind of link between the harbor and, and sort of the back road west, the, the sort of artist's part of the town. And as a, as, a, as a studio, as a building holding galleries, it seems that it works better than, in a way, as a church because it's so closely connected with Porthmere Studios and the other things that ha happening up there. Next, please. Um, I mean, it is a f fairly astonishing building. I don't think any of us would get permission to do something like this there <laughs> now. I mean, I'm not saying we necessarily should, but next, please. It is an interesting place, so that that's seen from... I've got my back to Porthmere Studios taking this photograph, and of course it's right across from it. Um, next, please. And looking back, you know, there's, there's the School of Painting sort of behind that arch. They're very closely connected. And next, please. And it's, uh, that entrance goes to uh, a gallery that's been the St. Ives Society of Artists Gallery since the 1940s. And so um, what's interesting is if you go to the next slide, that this is another building with a top and a bottom, and the crypt, because of the hill, the crypt comes out of the ground and has windows in it and a, an entrance into it. And of course, the project that we're looking at now is trying to get the St. Ives archive into the crypt, um, and also to get a, a way up from the crypt into the gallery so that from the harbor, instead of going all the way up to the top to get into the gallery, you can go up the hill and into the crypt and up into the gallery. And some suddenly, as a link between the harbor and Back Road West, it becomes quite a, it, it becomes quite a significant thing. Um, next, please. So that's the, that's the entrance to the crypt, which is right there. <coughs> and from there, next, please, you're just, you know, you're just up from the harbor. And there you are, back at that um, critical place in town. So I find that a really interesting thing. How to give it, because it's there and it's so visible, it has to really work for the town. And I think if you can get the two levels of it working, so you're almost making another stitching together of the harbor and back road west by the way the building works inside, it gives it more significance. It makes it, 
almost less objectionable if people see it as objectionable because it will be more fundamental to the way you use the town and move through it. And I don't find it objectionable. I think it's sort of interesting building. Of course, the other new building is that. And um, that comes at a place where everything changes. I mean, clearly when it was the gas works, it was the end of this kind of texture of development. And it was just before the, you know, the cemetery on the hill and all that stuff starts. So it's in a, it's in a junction where you can insert a building, like at Falmouth. It's at a place which is not like what's next to it, and therefore it can accept a very new kind of building. I, and I think, next please, um, you know, I think that, that clearly shows its relationship to, you know, it's sort of all changed at this point with this happening immediately behind it. Um, next please. Uh, well, that's just a sketch. I was just exploring the same issue. Next please. And its form, I mean, its form is a kind of nod back at the idea of gas works, I think. And it's a bit like making a shed in Falmouth, I think. You sort of you look at what was on the site and maybe there's something to do with the new building that refers back to it a bit. And I think the tape does that, and I think it's made out of materials which are sort of consistent with what's going on around it. So, uh, uh, then to go back to Falmouth, oops, if Sorry. we... Um, I just want to talk a little bit about architectural language because, okay, we said we'll put a shed there, but it also isn't a shed, it's a public building. So what language do you really, what, and it's not, I don't want to talk about style because I think that's kind of, all this implies that you, you kind of paint it on or you pick it out of a pattern book or something. But what's the language of the building? How does it actually work? Um, next please. Um, I, I think this is an interesting building. This is McKim Meaden White. Um, it's kind of also kind of turn of the 20th century. It's a kind of golf club out in the countryside. And it's at a time when they were doing mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York that were amazing, classical, refined, classical buildings. And they came to this site and they, they said, we'll build a shed. So they built a shed with a silo, but it isn't a shed in a silo. I mean, look at the, the detailing. It's, it's incredibly sort of refined, elegant um, detailing on this building. And this, this funny little door, sort of, it's, it's really quite mannered, sort of sticking this door in the corner and kind of just tilting the last bit of roof up over it. And, and then put, jamming this big arch up against the side of this tower. And then this, I mean, unbelievable. You know, you get this curved thing and then suddenly you make this bracket to hold up a pediment. I mean, it's very quirky and very um, personal, um, but it's made of traditional uh, wood shingles. It's a wood shingle shed. Uh, yes, sure, and, and, and a lot of other things. And it's very interesting that it's a... I think it's a completely authentic building in a way because it's built out of contemporary details and materials. Um, and I think it works very well as a, as a shed. So going back to Falmouth, um, I mean, what, one of our problems in Falmouth was how do you build in that environment and use materials that are going to not require huge amounts of maintenance. And there are very few materials that you can stick on the waterfront and not do anything to. And green oak, in other words, un Un, undried oak is one of the few materials you can just put there and it'll sit there for 50 years and it'll get gray and it'll get black in places but it'll sit there and it'll protect the building and keep the rain out and it won't require anything anything at all done to it so that's where we started with this building was okay it's in the nature of, a, of the sort of sheds that were on the site but it's it's going to be an updated version of that next please and then you start saying, but it isn't really a shed, it's a museum, it's got some quite complicated geometry to it, it's got a succession of galleries, it's got a, this tower to get up, got a tidal gallery at the bottom to look into the sea. I mean, it's not just a shed. Um, next, please. And it's all about daylight and how you get daylight into different galleries, so that affects its shape too. Next, please. And in the end, we tried to keep it quite simple, but we had to stay low at this end of the site for all sorts of complicated covenant reasons. 
and we wanted to be high at this end of the site because that's the frontage that makes the, the public square at the entrance end of the museum that was going to be used for projecting images on and all kinds of things. And we finally fit, we fiddled around and finally said, well, the simplest thing is just take the shed roof and tilt it. Because it actually does what we want it to do. It's still a big thing seen from across the harbor, but it's a little bit odd. And that oddness kind of makes you ask, well, what is that? And that makes it not a shed, but possibly a public building. So it's, it was a kind of tricky little dance. And then next, please. When you do get to that frontage uh, facing the square, um, it's much more abstract because it's a backdrop. It's like a stage house for performances. It's a kind of more abstract thing than the shed out in the harbor. So the detailing changes a bit. Next, please. Um, it's the, the oak is used in a slightly different way. The columns are clad. It's a more building that you sort of come up against a bit more. Um, next, please. And I, I just think it's important for, for me that an idea about modern architecture is not that it's without references or that it's steel and glass and concrete and rectangular, but that it can be whatever it authentically turns out to be to answer you know, the, the, the needs of the people who are going to use it the kinds of materials that you can get out there in the market that are available and all those things and still have a kind of personality to it. This is a house designed in 1939 by um, Alvaro Alto and at one end of the house there's a traditional Finnish sauna detailed exactly the way Karelian saunas have been detailed for hundreds of years with lashed together poles and grass on the roof and wooden gutters and all that stuff. And inside, a kind of modern, oops, a sort of modern take on that kind of cluster of poles becomes very cool and sleek, uh, modern interior with, um, you know, wonderful natural materials and these sort of raffia bound columns. And those are those sit very comfortably in a single building, which you would say is a modern building. Nobody would argue that it's a modern building. And for me, the important thing is that a modern building can include all kinds of references and echoes of historic situations, textures, and use of materials without losing its modernism, as long as that's done in an authentic way that has to do with how the, music, how the building's used, how the material works, and is it trying to look like something else? Um, so to end, I think, um, I'm just back to the business about looking at differences, that what makes a place vivid, what makes St. Ives vivid, is the difference between Portsmouth Beach and the harbour. And to try to elide that, or to think that, you know, that what you do in one place should be similar to something you do in another place, I think is to weaken the, the drama of the place, which is what gives it its personality. It's those differences. So in Falmouth, it's the difference between this big thing and the, the little things. It's the, it's the recognition of the difference between a tower and a shed and developing both of them in ways which are modern in technique and material and different from each other in ways that towers and sheds are different from each other technically and that that's where you find your your language and your way of operating um, and I think that'll do as a last slide I hope. so thank you, thank you.